in uh, Baltimore. 90 seconds. 90 seconds, wow. 90-second annual convention. Of course, we know more about the picture of today, but you know from the property we started in 1928. So we go down there, and of course, people come from all over. And it's down there from 15th to 20th, most of us. And every day was something new. It was a new experience. You get more in-depth information about the Circle 7, about the movement, about what's going on. You get to meet brothers from, I mean, brother was coming from Indiana. One brother, he came from Iowa. Iowa. This brother was on a bus for 33 hours, man. He just came with his bags. He didn't know where he was staying at, how he was even getting home. But he knew he was coming to that convention. Gotta respect that as well. And it was just a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Cause whenever, because like I said, we know what it is, man. We go with our daily grind. We go through our own things or whatever. But we know we gotta come to the temple. And sometimes, you know, you feel that kind of like, ah, oh, man. But whenever you go to Baltimore or whatever, that's like that battery in that back. Like, oh, man, we gotta go back to New York. We gotta get, it, get this thing going or whatever. And of course, like I said, it's always a learning experience. And of course, um, of course, we gotta introduce officially a new sheik, Sheik Muhammad Bey. Islam. Islam. He you know, did what he had to do, so now he's officially sheik. Islam. Islam. And um, like I say, yo, it's just a great experience, man, to have all these people that because everybody come up there and they, they say their little things. And it's just inspiration, man. So definitely next year we're talking about having it in uh, Chicago. That's the home, that's the Mecca. So October 15th through the 20th. Mark it on your calendars now. I know myself, start putting a little money away now so we can make that trip. And it's long. It's long. And um, that's about it for now. But uh, start going into what I was going to go into today. I just want to go a, a little bit more because. Uh, like I said, we know the prophet Noble Jewel, he, he, he left us, what well, we say, we say he left us breadcrumbs. But we know, once you pick up on these clues, you read in between the lines and do your own research, so much of what he put out makes so much more sense. I don't care, you go through the whole circle seven, if you look up all this stuff, whatever, it makes sense, and you can somehow you can tie it back to us. That the grand sheet, like the way he did the demonstration, he brought us back to the Nazarene. So that right there, so when you look into the Bible and the circle seven, things like that, now you gotta look and vision, put yourself into it. That's one thing these Christians, they did. They disconnected us from that. So they gave us the Bible, like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's all good, though. But the prophet, he reconnected us through that. Islam. That's why he said, don't throw away the Bible. And of course, you know, we're supposed to pro 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 propagate the faith of, of Muhammad. So that's why, they, you know, that takes us through the Is Islam degree. And of course, Islamism. But again, like I said, because I, of course, I have family down in the South or whatever. And so, of course, you know, the prophet number drew a He's from North Carolina or whatever, so that kind of opened my, my, my mind up to like, you know, look into a little bit of that. So of course, you know, over time, whatever, when I did my demonstration, I went into like how we've been coming over here in different ways, from the Almex, even uh, the Canaanites, the, the Kemetic, the Hebrews, all these dudes coming over way, even the Celts, the Iberians and all this and that, and pretty much I'm just trying to put it all together because how they say, Mastermind can trace himself by going back. Islam. Islam. You know what I'm saying? We don't know about being being told. That's all we got to do is research. Islam. Islam. So, but um, matter of fact, one thing I, I wanted to go into, and that's why I started going to the Almex. And even if it was disappointing and whatever, the, the Almex, whatever they, it was proven fact that they had a, a, a brotherhood, a priesthood among, amongst them. And of course, in, the, in that priesthood, whatever, they wore a conical hat, whatever, and they said they tied that back back to the Magi. And of course, when you do your research, if you already have it, whatever, you go into Sarosta, and you can tie that, because the, the three wise men who came to visit the, uh, Jesus, was the, they was actually Magi. So they knew about astrology, so you know what I'm saying, you gotta dip into that. And then to get that, like, yo, wait a minute, the Almighty came over here with this brotherhood? And then even that, still, last week, I went into, going into, dealing mostly with the southeast of America, how uh, a lot of these so-called Native Americans, what they like call them indigenous people, how they had traced that date back to the Hebrews. Mm. Well, even in the one of the, I'm looking for this paperwork here, one that I forgot last week, but I know I put it. 
with me this week. But um, going back into, uh, and this is where the author, this book goes back into like 1700s. Even though he said, I just want to work, but he said that the arch magus, the high priest of the Persian magi, were worshippers of fire. Pretty much what he said, he said amongst these Native Americans, whatever he said, it was the arch magus. And of course, that goes back to the, the magi. Or any, any one of the magi is persuading the people of their religious uh, solemnities to strict observance of the old, beloved of divine speech. So pretty much what I was just trying to point out, trying to put across, from the Olmecs over here, they had these priesthoods, which go back to the Magi. Of course, we know, go back to the, a lot of it go back to the land of Canaan. It came over here to the Americas, the Olmecs brought it. Of course, you know, after the Olmecs, we had the Mayans, we had the Incas, the Aztecs. And then, of course, you know, when Islam came over here, where Abu Dhabi and his people, they came up, they made their way up to Mexico. And now, of course, we working our way up to now the Southeast, which, of course, some of the major tribes was the Cherokee, the Chick Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Muscogee, and now I'm saying a lot of these had these traits. And of course, now here, this author was talking about, yeah, they have an arch magus, whatever. They have a priesthood that goes all the way back to ancient times over here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, and of course, now you got to put this all together, whatever. This is the area where Prophet Noah Dooley was born. He was born in North Carolina, right? 1886. 1886, right? So now <laughs> we, now we make a more sense. Like, man, yo, this, the man was destined to be divine. Islam? Islam. Uh -huh. But um, again, I can't find the page. I don't feel like going over there and look for it. But we can start off with uh, today. Go to Morris Wood of Quran, chapter 48. Now I just want to just want to go a little bit further into more of like how the so the Native Americans, whatever, how the, a lot of our roots, whatever, trace back to to Hebrews, the Israelites, according to this author. But you know, it gets a little deeper than that. Chapter 48, and I can read verse 3 and 5. Chapter 48, the end of time and the fulfilling of the prophecy. In these modern days, there came a forerunner who was divinely prepared by the great God Allah, and his name is Marcus Garvey, who did teach and warn the nations of the earth to prepare to meet the coming prophet, who was to bring the true and divine creed of Islam, and his name is Nobu Du Ali. So now I'm starting to lead, lead, lead up to that. So like I said, now you start, it starts to make sense. You know, this priesthood that been over here, whatever, and now of course it's over here in Southeast America, it's over there in what we call North Carolina now, whatever. And now it's passed on to our Papa Nobu Dua Ali, Islam. Islam. And now thanks to him, he brought us into the light, Islam. Continue. Who was prepared and sent to this earth by Allah to teach the old time religion and the everlasting gospel to the sons of men? That's what he does, Islam. That every nation shall and must worship under their own vine and fig tree, and return to their own and be one with their father God Allah. Islam. So right there, he's telling us right there that yo, we gotta be one. We gotta do our own thing. There is a way, there's a way that we're living in the world because we know we uh, honor our ancient fathers and foremothers, whatever, but when we was put into slavery, when we was captured to war, whatever, and they took away our language and our history and all this, and now they just emptied us up, whatever, spiritually, and they filled us up with theirs. Nonsense. That's what it is. But thanks to Papa Nobu Drew Ali, he's, he's waking us up. Islam? Islam. But now, that was it? No, no, three and five. Three and five, okay. Okay, Islam. That the world may hear and know the truth that among the descendants of Africa there is still much wisdom to be learned in these days for the redemption of the sons of men under love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Islam. Out of the sins of Africa. Like I said, just to use an example, the Canaanites, where they came over here, they came through Africa. The Omex, we know they from Africa. Abu Bakari, whatever, he came from Africa. And of course, you know, now everybody went back, we stayed here, we multiplied, and we stayed. So out of the descendants, there's much to be learned. Islam? Islam. So that's our job to go out here up, up the fallen humanity to wake the people up. So now, okay, I just want to put that on the mind, whatever. So now I just want to go back a little bit, going back again, dealing with that area. The Southeast, the Carolinas, Alabama, uh, Florida, Georgia, and all that. Again, these uh, traders, the Europeans, when they went, came across the Native Americans, you know what I'm saying? They were taking a note. They were observing, just like how they do today, whatever. Like I said, they'll come to the neighborhood, they observe us, they get cool, and once they get in there, whatever, they take over. Islam. Look what they did with this land, Islam. Islam. But going back to uh, the Native, 
slaves, Native Americans. They count time after the manner of the Hebrews. Even the way they were doing time or whatever, it flashed back to like, yo, this is like the Hebrews. Counting time by weeks or seven was a very ancient custom. Of course, it was practiced by Syrians, Egyptians, and others. Seven days was used in the story of creation among the Hebrews. And there you can go into Genesis 1 and, of course, in Exodus 20, 11. We don't have to go into that right now. And sanctifying the seventh day. All right, you can go into Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3. So right here, now even going back to the earth, early chapters of the book, Genesis, or what they call Bereshit, which means in the beginning, it, it tells the first thing it tells you how to be rest on the seventh day. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all the work. He rested from all the work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Islam. Islam. So that's when we put that in mind because we all know that's what it is. That's what the Israelites follow, whatever. But now they're even seeing that over here amongst the, the Indians. And of course you can also find that in uh, Exodus 20.10, but we don't have to read that. The number and regular periods of the Indian public religious feasts, of which presently is a good historical proof that they counted time by and observed the weekly Sabbath long after the arrival of the American continent. So right there, even in, back in 1700s, it's like, yo, they, they keep in this way, whatever, even after they came to the continent. So it's like, yo, how you, you know these people came from over here, right? And this is, again, this is going back to the 1700s, 18, early 1800s. As long. They began the year at the first of the new moon of the vernal equinox according to ecclesiastical year of Moses. Take the time with this one. Okay, we're going to the vernal equinox. There's two moments in the year when the, when the sun is exactly abo above the equator and the day and night is equal length. Now, also, it says that they, they go according to the ecclesiastic year of Moses. So they start their year off at the same way they did in Moses, at Moses' time. Now, the reason we go into Exodus. 12, 12, 2. Because I'm going to go into this calendar, whatever, because I know at first of all, it's confusing me, and of course I got to clarify something I did in one of my early demonstrations. So, wow. This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. What, what um, chapter and verse? Exodus 12, verse 2. But the month that they're talking about it. It's, it doesn't say, it said the name of the month actually in Exodus 13, four, 13 verse 4. Matter of fact, you can go through that real quick. Today, in the month of Abib, you are leaving. Oh, Islam. So, right there, that's the first time you mentioned it. That's the month of Abib. Now, in their months, each, each consists of 20, 29 days, 12, 12 hours, and 49 minutes which makes the moon to consist of 29 and 30 days. They pay a great regard to the first appearance of every new moon and always repeat the same joyful sounds. Now right here, like I said, whenever there's a, whenever there's a new moon, they have like a little ceremony, they have songs or whatever. And it's also the same thing amongst a lot of Israelites or whatever, they, they go through numbers 28 and they read like one to 15 every time there's a new moon. And of course, it depends on where you go. And of course, some congregation, you go to some, some temples, whatever, they, they read out the, what you call this here is a sidur. This is like a prayer book about Sabbaths and festivals. This whole thing is about Sabbaths. And in here, they actually have one about the new moon. So now this, of course, this is of course the, ble the blessing of the new moon. Of course, and we'll go through it, but this thing is long. It's like one, two, three like four or five pages. So every month, whenever it's a new moon, they go through this. So now the people over there from the land of Canaan, they was doing this. So now the Europeans who understood our ways or whatever, but now they come amongst the Native Americans, they're like, yo, they're doing the same thing. Islam. Can you read the Bible? Islam. Um, okay, this is blessing of the blessing of the new month. Yehi, Yehi, uh, 
Rat Yehi wrote Rat Song. Yehi Ma Song Papaneka, may be your will. Yahuwah Eloheinu. Here they say Hashem our God, but we know we know that's Yahuwah our God. Rat or like Re Re Lo Re Lohe Ad Ab Abotenu. And the uh, and the and the God of our forefathers, Shateka Desh Alen Alenu Et Hakadesh Hakodesh That's Nunu Hazay, and you will inaugurate this month upon us. La La Tova Ule Uli Uli Raka for goodness and for the blessing. I mean, it goes on. Like I said, this thing is like three, four pages, and then it breaks down to like when it's different types of months, you fill in the name of that month. But I just want to put that, but that's not all, not every, every, every temple you go to, they're going to do the same thing. Uh, let me see. Okay, now we go to Genesis 1, verse 14. Right there, I'm just comparing whatever the way that the Israelites was doing it, and now again, of course, you know, the so called Indians, they was over here doing the same thing. That right there just had more proof that we've been over here, even before Columbus. I mean, we got so many facts and proof of it, but this is just another angle you can hit people with. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark the seasons and days. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. It's wrong. So right here, I say, even going back to the first chapter, already how we talk about how to use the size, how we use it as a sign to change the month. So pretty much when a new moon comes, it, uh, it's a new month. Because, of course, they go by the lunar calendar. They don't go by the Gregorian calendar that we go by. And that's why in their holy, well, I'll get to that later. So that's why it's a... Their months, whenever their new month starts, it's a, new, it's a new moon. That's why you have to keep track of the moon or whatever to understand the true calendar that they use. It's wrong. It's wrong. Of course, it, it fluctuates. You know, it may change a little bit from year to year. Now, and of course, again, like I mentioned before, Numbers 28 to 11 to 15, they, they're supposed to read that at the beginning of the new month. And of course, they have prayers and festivals for it. And of course, Native Americans are doing the same thing. It's wrong. It's wrong. Now, let's fast forward a little bit. Till seventy years captivity commenced, the Israelites had only one new, one only numeral names for the solar and lunar months, except for Abib, which we already read, and Etnim. The former Abib signified a green ear of corn, and the later Etnim robust, 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 and valiant. And the first name Abib, the Indians are explicative terms. Is around the time of the Passover. So, all right, let's try to get myself ahead all jumbled up here. So now, right there, now we go into the first month, which was called Abib. Pretty much, that, that's around springtime. So now that, that's when they start their calendar. Over the Israelites start their calendar. One of their calendars. Now over here, the Native Americans they do the same thing around the same time. That's when they start their calendar. Of course, it's, it's like, that's what I need to put. It's, it's all us, because of course, when you go through it, they already done put it out there, whatever they went amongst us, whatever, the Americans, the Native Americans, they had copper tongue skin. They use the term Native American war. Native American war, Islam. So, Hebrew war, so people could have, sometimes you don't put that in there, so you have that connect. Islam. Islam, okay. He, Hebrew Moors. Okay, so the more they do is Hebrew Moors over here, and they seen like how it lines up. The Hebrew Moors over here was lined up right with the Hebrew Moors over there across the seas throughout the rest of the world. And I'm just gonna go into a little bit more of that. Now, by the Abib, the, the Indians, as an explicit term, their Passover, pretty much saying around the same time that the Israelites have their Passover, they call theirs the green, uh, green ear, corn, green ear of corn, 
which is the trading people call, uh, call the, they may do a little dance, the green corn dance. Go to Exodus 13, verses 3 and 5. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing wheat. Today, in the month of Abib, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Hittites Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. Um, now, of course, now, when they talk about the, the Passover, the course that I just broke down, around that time, that's when the Israelites, they celebrate their, how they escaped their bondage out of Egypt. That's when they had the Passover, they celebrate the week, they don't eat unleavened bread, and, um, they, you know, they, they, they celebrate this, and what around we was taught was Easter. But now, of course, now I'm going to tie in a little bit more how the Hebrew moves over here, how, how it all ties in. Islam. Islam. So now, right there, you heard he said that this is the month of Abi. This is when they're supposed to begin their, their, their calendar. So, of course, you know, I look for a Hebrew angle or whatever. Let me look up with Abi. See what that means. Islam. From an unused root, which means to be tender, green, young ear of grain. Hence, the name of the month of Abi, or Nisan, that's Jews call it now, but also a bead, ear, green ears of corn. So now the Hebrew moons over here, they had a festival called the green ear of corn, but over there the Israelites were like, oh yeah, this we start our holy days in the month of a bead, but a bead means green ear of corn. Mm -hmm. Is it corn indigenous to Canaan? Is it corn even? No, my understanding is indigenous to America. It's called, no, they, in Canaan, they call it, well, according to the, the Bible, it started in the month of a bee, which means green hair corn. That's what I'm saying, that's the difference between green hair corn, when there's no corn. There's no corn, no corn over there. So now that's all right, that's one thing, like, so now you gotta, when you do your research, you gotta put that together, like, yo, so wait a minute. So now, you just put put out there whatever, so like, were they following us, or were we following them? You know, that's something, something you can put on your mind. As the Israelites generally understood nothing but the shadow of the literary part of the law, so the Indians closely imitate them, minding only the tradition part, which has promised them a delicious land flowing with milk and honey. And again, if you're talking about this land, talking about milk and honey, you go to Exodus 3.17, so you always hear about this land flowing of milk and honey, milk and honey. You know how many times you hear that about America? This is land of milk, milk and honey. Slow. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery into Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Islam. Again, what? you're saying they're supposed to go into the land of the Canaanites. Islam. Exodus uh, 3, verse 17. Thank you. So now, of course, now I want to want to go into the calendar. Like I said before, I made something. I made a reference about the count about the calendar and about the seventh seventh month. I want to clarify that in this next part. The Jewish months of B and Etanim are equinoctial. E I can't get that right. Pretty much this around time is happening near the time of the equinox. Equinoctial. Equinoctial. Wow, appreciate it. Equinoctial. Abi or Nis Nisan was, was the seventh of the civil year and the first of the classical year. So now what that means, you go into, there was, there was more than one calendar that they used. They had a civil calendar and they had a calendar for their holy days. So now, of course, now of course, the Jew Jewish 
there's two or two years or whatever. Of course, we have calendar, which we read. When the first one, when it starts in the month of B, that's when you start the holy days. That's not the civil year. That starts, that starts in a, a B. So when you go to Leviticus 23, whatever, when it breaks down the holy day, the day that we're supposed to celebrate and not go to work and all this and that, these are our ancient traditions that our forefathers are doing that we're supposed to keep. And that started, that's just to keep track of the holy day. So a B is the first. Now, in my demonstration before, when you get to the month of Tishrei, which the Jews call now, but Jews call is really Etanim, is actually the seventh month, and that's when you hear Rosh Hashanah. That's where they celebrate the new year. That is the new year. That's the beginning on the civil calendar. Those who just do regular businesses, that's where their calendar starts. That starts in the seventh month, Islam, around September, October. Hmm. Islam? Islam. So, now, of course, here, yeah, then, of course, I already went into that. that. That's the holy day. Now, this is the civil year, the point of the year, which the years are counted. This is historically dated upon the sages. That was the date of creation of man. So, they go back, they believe that this is. So right now they're in the year 5,780, so they believe Adam was 5,700 years ago. So now, of course, well now what, what they call Rosh Hashanah, which would be like the new year, we call it Yom Tura, that's the year of blow, blow, that's the festival of blowing of the horn. It kicked off, again, like I said, this is, well, this is the old one, but it says 5,780. Counting the years from Tishrei, which would be Etanim, Yom Tura, it's also the date for calculating the release year of the, the Shem, Shemta year, which means sabbatical year, which is every seventh year in the 49th cycle that the, that the governed the kingdom, that governed the kingdom of Israel from 10th century BC to about 8th century BC, and the kingdom of Judah from 10 BC to about 6 BC. In biblical times, and the date for calculating the Jubilee year a jubilee or yovel year in Hebrew is the year after the 49th cycle. And that governed the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah in biblical times, i.e. the 50th year. Now this should sound familiar, though. Where have you heard this? Mm -hmm. oh. It'll be a jubilee. Islam. And it's right here on our liberty bell over here. So right there, so you know what I'm saying? So now that's what they use. They use, they start their year off in, in, uh, or the civil year, they start that off in, in uh, Tishrei, Etanim. Okay, let me see, finish this up first. Now the first day of, of they, they use the Jewish words, I'm using, of course we're going back to ancient Hebrew. The first day of Etanim was also the date that determined the beginning of the year when it came to the three years that the fruit of a tree must be left unpicked. You can find that in Leviticus 19.23, so you gotta go to that right now. The first day of, of Ethanim was also the day that the tip, tip of crops for the Levites and the priesthood, aka the Kohanim, whose dedication to the holy service prevented them from working the land, land like other Hebrews. So now, let me get into this number seven here a little bit. Because like right here, and of course now these people over here, that Hebrews, Hebrew Moors over here, whatever, how they had so many similar ways. Now, this is just a quick list of the months. Now, when you start from the Hebrew, the holy ones, Abib is first. So, right there, and when you go to the Bible, they said uh, Abib is supposed to be the first month. That's only when you count the holy days. So, Abib is first. Ziv, Sivan, Tammuz, Ab, El, Elul, and Etanim. Etanim is the seventh month. Of course, that's the most the holiest month. That's the day of blowing of the horn, that's Yom Kippur. And around, around that time, wherever, it's also Sukkot, which was around the same time as we just had our uh, convention. That's when they celebrate uh, the bringing the last of the fruits. And also they live out in the booths. That's why if you go around synagogues or whatever, you see a lot of booths or whatever, because they represent the ancient ways. And of course, people over here were doing the same similar thing. So now, now on a holy month, Etanim is the seventh. And it's also, the, the uh, of course, one of the holiest months. But when you start on the civil year, the civil year will start with Etanim, you have uh, Bull, Kislev, Tabet, Shabet, Adar, and then Abib. Abib is the seventh month when you go into civil year. And that's also a holy month, because that's when you start the holy day. So again, it's just that seven or whatever, just seven just keeps popping up. It's long. It's long. Uh, where am I? Okay, the two 
Jewish month. Mm -hmm. Jump ahead of myself. The civil year was seven months. Get, yep, I get that. And the Indians named the very season of, of the year from the planting and ripening of the fruits. The green ear moon is the most beloved and sacred. Now, of course, this is the Hebrew moors over here. The green ear, that's the most sacred month. That's the beginning of the holy day. That's wrong. The green ear is the most sacred and beloved the seventh month of the civil calendar year. When the first fruits become sanctified by being annually offered up, and from the pyramid they count their beloved and holy things. So of course now, because this is the ways of, like I said, I mentioned the uh, Hebrew Moors, Israelites, and all this and that. But one of the things, what does the prophet call us? And even if we read a couple of times, whatever, all these people, they're trying to get away from the bondage and all they're trying to get into the land of Cain, right? Can you call us Cain and Isaac? Where did they get their culture from? The Hebrew, the Israelites, where did they get their culture from? Canaan. Yeah, who's Canaanites? I don't know about Canaanites. I don't know. Huh? Let's go into the holy days. Islam, as you said, day three, right? What did you say? Even now, sir. days. The holy days of ancient Israel originated for the most part occurred before the conquest, but they were all transformed after the settlement in Canaan to adapt them to the conditions of agricultural life. Now this right here, you got to use your, you got to put it together, that's why the prophet said to study the Bible. So now when they came out of the land of bondage, supposedly they said that they was in the wilderness for 40, 40 years. So if you if you want to move for like forty years, when do you get time to like yo? This is the stars, this is the moon, and all this and that. You need to set up crops, and you got to be here for seven weeks and get the crops out the ground and all this and that, and then move on. The new moon was a primitive Semitic festival, but among the later Hebrews, it was connected with agriculture. See, it wasn't until they came into the land of Canaan that they learned that like okay, they, they a lot of these festivals they twist not twisted it. It switched over to agriculture. Because the Holy Days really is all about agriculture. You go to Leviticus 23, that's where the Holy Days are at. And whenever you read about it, it's all about you're bringing this fruit. You take this, you're cooking this, you're doing all this and that. It's all about agriculture. But again, it just says, in the Bible, it says these people's on the move for like 40 years. So when they get time to understand and, and do all this. But among later Hebrews, it was connected, yeah, connected with agriculture. On it and buying and selling the grain was prohibited. You go to uh, Amos 8.5. Because of course, see, this is in there. This is a part of their, part of their culture. And the, field, and the field was not done. That was in 2 Kings. Verifying, and you know, it's even in a book. The person not just making stuff up. Chapter eight, verse five. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Amos chapter eight, verse five. Saying, "When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scale." <laughs> this is the way, whatever. See, even on the new moon, they ain't do no business. That's the same thing they do on the Sabbath. That's why this prayer book right here is all about the Sabbath and festival. Because they almost, it treats it the same. Like the new moon, you know, we don't do this, we don't do that. Uh, just like uh, on the Sabbath. Islam? Islam. And no, of course, no field work is done. That's, that's throughout the Bible. In like manner, the Sabbath, which is habitually connected with the new moon phase, and new moon to Sabbath, which we already read out this out the prayer book. And of course, you can also find that in Numbers 28 and 15, we ain't gotta go to it, how it's talking about the new moon and Sabbath together, which apparently was originally connected with the four phases of the moon, was changed after the occupation of Canaan into a day of rest from agricultural labor. So that's what they did. When they talk about no day, you don't have to do no silver work, this is 
pretty much this is farmers or whatever. So you work six days or whatever, but you know, in that six days, you know, you rest. Now me, I go through my own personal experience or whatever. Like you know, summer, I worked down, went down south on a farm. You know, we worked six days or whatever, when we used to, we used to off. But the thing is, of course, in Christianity, they changed that off day to Sunday. Which you know, the black, black slave, code, Christian black slave code, 1724, that's how they, they twisted it on us. It's supposed to be that Saturday we're supposed to be off, which is the Sabbath, Islam. Islam. That's on the ancient cultures. Again, like I said, I'm just tying it in how the Hebrew Moors over here was demonstrating these type of things. This is the way we were living over here for centuries, Islam. Islam. Yeah. And of course, we already read that in six, six days thou shalt do no work. Of course, they used tilling of the ground, but that's the work they were doing. On the seventh day, thou shalt keep a Sabbath. In plowing time and the harvest, thou shalt keep a Sabbath. The Sabbath may be known to the Canaanites, and this change in the character from the astronomical to agricultural holy day may have been already, excuse me, may have been made already by them. Since I say the Canaanites was already on this. slow it down, so now we'll be rushing for no reason. Of course, we go into the six days thou shalt work. Of course, they use, of course, tilling the land and ground. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, thou shalt, thou shalt keep a Sabbath. In plowing time and in harvest, thou shalt keep a Sabbath. In plowing time and harvest time, that's the holy days. So between what we know as Passover, what they taught us as uh, Easter, all the way up to, to, the, to the fall. Of course, at the same time, it lines up as astronomical or whatever, because now this, the spring begins, which is new life, it's the green ear corn, or it's the month of Abib in the Bible, depending on which side of the water you're talking about, it all lines up. But of course, you have to know the stars and the moon and understand what it is. You have to know the months or whatever, like, this is the time to uh, start planting the seeds. So of course, now during this time, whatever, it says to keep a Sabbath. As long during the, during the time of, of uh, harvesting, hmm. in plowing time and in harvest, thou shalt keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath may have been known to the Canaanites, and this change in its character from an astronomical, again, from an astronomical to an agricultural holy day may have been made, may have made already, excuse me, may have been made already by them. So they're trying to say the Canaanites was already on this. So in the end, of course, you know, you go in the Bible, I would say, like, you know, Moses had this and all that, and he passed it on to the people, and then they went to the land of Canaan. But now, archaeological proof, because we don't just look at one book, because that's not the way we was taught. That's not how we're supposed to do things. We know we look, we compare, get some historical books, do some more research, compare with this book and that book or whatever, and then now it's going back. So it's like, now you do your research, you find out, like, ah, Canaan is already on that. It's long. It's long. And what the prophet calls us. We said it came out as more like Lord. Are you saying that the holy days were originally amongst the Canaanites? Islam. Just like just like when, you know, when we'll go into another time, but just like even with the with the God, we go back to even El. El, you know, of course, was the deity, was a Canaanite deity. So when they came in, when they came amongst the Canaanites, those who were doing the righteousness and living the righteous way, they took on their ways. And a lot of the characteristics that they give to Yahweh or whatever, it all you can trace it back to the Canaanite deity, Islam. Islam. The Passover was undoubtedly a primitive Semitic spring festival accompanied with sacrifice of the firstborn lamb. But a celebration with unleavened bread in, in the legislation discloses Canaanite influence. And again, of course, you know, we're going to go into that in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and Exodus chapter 12. No, you ain't got to go into that now. But uh, that just is right there saying this came like influence. People, again, it's going back to influence. That's why the problem number one, early, even in our circle seven, of course, you know, Jesus was referred to uh, several times as the Jewish master or whatever. Prophet number one, early, never said that he was a Jew. Mm. I mean, if I'm missing something, did he ever say that he was Jewish? Did he call us Israelites? He called us Canaanites, right? Islam. So now I think that's on us to go out there and do as much research as we can, not only on the Moabs, on the Moors, on Canaanites, and see how it all ties in. And that's by studying that. Look at that, bring it over here to the Americas, and going back to what I was talking about before, how this priesthood was over here, going back for a thousand years. And obviously, we know our prophet was, was amongst them. 
Now, three pilgrims feasts yearly to seem, seem, seem to have been a feature of the primitive mosaic religion. But after the occupation of Canaan, they were transformed into agricultural festivals. So again, like I said, though, it wasn't until they came into the land of Canaan, until they came around Canaan, that's when they switched it to agriculture. And some of the stuff is repetitive, so I don't want to keep banging you on the head. But after the occupation of Canaan, they were then going to da, 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 da. the feast of unleavened bread celebrated the early <laughs> yeah the feast of unleavened bread celebrated the early barley wheat or ba a barley harvest that's around Passover you go to you to come around it's like the, the Passover that's like a, a week long that's celebrating it it's all based, based on agriculture that's the point I'm trying to get and trying to get the same time they was having festivals over here in the Bible world the same time the Hebrew Moors over here was happening. So-called Native Americans, which is Hebrew more, Islam. Islam. And the reason that was going by, because in one of my prior demonstrations, Canaanites been over here. They've been over here from New York all the way out to the Midwest. They found artifacts going back like a thousand BC. Mm. Even here in New York, seven hundred BC, uh, Iowa, Oklahoma, by the uh, Great Great Lakes, they found Canaanites. But this, the thing is, how they read the work, but they used to say like Paleo Hebrew. Which is like that ancient Hebrew. That's Canaanite. The reason we know that, because they found a sarcophagus in the, the city of Bibelos that had the same sarcophagus over there in the land of Canaan. And once they found that, they were able to crack the code. It's like, yo, these Canaanites were really doing this thing. Mm. They was. Islam. Huh? And we are. Islam. Islam. And it consists of eating cakes of unleavened bread for seven days in the month of Abib. The holiest code. That's in Leviticus 23.11. Add that it comes at a time when a harvest is reaped and prescribed that a sheaf of first fruits be weighed before Yahweh. This is also why unleavened cakes are eaten. People are so impatient to taste the new crop that they do not want to wait for the process of leaven. That's, that's, that's what they say. A feast of this sort evidently cannot have originated in the desert. It is part of the agricultural ritual of the land of Canaan. And of course, it just pretty much it just goes on to all, all the holy days, the festivals, or holy days, whatever. It switched over to agriculture, which of course it goes back to the Canaanites. And over here, the Hebrew Moors over here was doing the same thing, similar thing. And they call it different things. Perfect example, like they called it around the month of the holy month to start, they called it the green ear. You look up the, what a bee means, one of the definitions of a bee is the green ear corn. And as Grand Sheep pointed out, where is corn indigenous to? Americas. That's just something to put on your mind. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end this right here. So I guess you know later on if you have any questions, you know definitely always feel free to ask. And now we're gonna have his first demonstration of the sheep. Sheep Muhammad's back. Oh,